We'll now begin our final session before the keynote speech, in which we'll be talking about children's rights. Discussions surrounding the freedom of parents to raise their ch children according to their religion often neglect the rights of the children themselves. Do parents have a right to make life-altering decisions about their children based on their religious beliefs? Do children's bodies belong to their parents or to themselves? And to what extent should, pa should parents be able to limit their child's education in the name of religion if that education fails to prepare ch children for life in the UK? These are the questions our next two speakers will be discussing, starting with Izzy Posen. Izzy's life is nothing short of extraordinary. He was born and raised in a reclusive Hasidic Jewish community in London, learning no English and very little education beyond religious texts. At the age of 15, Izzy began to teach himself English and about the outside world, resulting in him, ev him eventually leaving his community and then becoming a student at the University of Bristol, where he is still a student, I think, and president of his free speech society. Um, I'd like you all to warmly welcome Izzy um, as he comes up to the podium. Thank you very much for that warm welcome. Um, I must say it's, very, it's extremely refreshing to be here, coming from the student campus context. Almost everything said here today is grossly Islamophobic on the campus context. <laughs> and we are all uh, a bunch of bigots and Nazis. Um, I'll talk more about that in, uh, when I, I'll come to talk about my free speech activism on campus. But it's just so refreshing that we can talk about important issues that you know we can't just hide from them. We can't pretend they don't exist. They exist. And sometimes they need sensitive talking about. But I don't think anyone here is actually a fascist or a Nazi or and, and it's amazing that we can have these discussions. So thank you for providing this space. Um, so as you can see on the picture I put up, um, just in case you don't know which one is me, I'm the one on the left. Um, <laughs> that is me in my Hasidic days, which is roughly until four years ago. And, I'm, and I'll tell you uh, a, a little bit about my story. So this is gonna be very much a personal account. Um, and then maybe at the end, if we have time, um, I know I was given 20 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what the government can do to solve these problems and how they might go about it. Um, but I'll, leave most, I'll, I'll, I'll mostly contain myself to a personal account. Uh, so I grew up in the uh, Hasidic Jewish community of Stamford Hill in East London, in the borough of Hackney. Um, um, another word, some sometimes referred to the Haredi community for the purpose of this talk, they're interchangeable. Um, so what does this community look like? It's not just any old extremist religious community. It's not just a, a community that you know, lives in society but has extremist views. This is much more like a cult. They live completely and utterly segregated from the rest of society, not physically. Physically, they live in London, and um, you know, we walk on the same streets as you may have walked, um, but spiritually, socially, completely isolated. Um, for example, we lived on a road in Stamford Hill, we had on the one side we had a Jewish neighbor, on the other side we had a non-Jewish neighbor. We were best friends with the Jewish neighbors, we played with their kids. We didn't even know what the non-Jewish neighbor was called. We didn't talk to them, didn't greet them. They were just not there. Um, the community mostly, especially men, speak Yiddish, not English. Most men in the Hasidic community of Stamford Hill don't know how to speak English. Um, and this is of course uh, an isolationist mechanism. So that even if they wanted to know what's on the outside, they cannot. Um, so how does this community arise and where did this extreme isolationism come from? So at the late 18th century, uh, a process of secularization and enlightenment happened in the Jewish community that started off in Germany, then spread to Eastern Europe as well. Most Jews secularized. So whereas up until that point, um, Jewish people saw themselves mostly as a religious community. From that point on, it was extremely common to start to see secular Jews and atheist Jews. As the case is today, most Jews are not religious or secular. As a response to that process, um, some Orthodox rabbis uh, started the process of isolating themselves from the rest of society. Um, so they started by formalizing Jewish dress. So Hasidic uh, dress code is very, very uh, recognizable. Men will wear black hats, long uh, black coats, beards and side locks. Um, you can see there I'm not wearing a black coat, that's already because it's in my rebellious period. 
Um, <laughs> women will, uh, will, will dress very modestly. Um, most married Hasidic women will have their heads shaven off um, um, so that uh, they can't, even if they wanted to, they couldn't show their hair to a, a, a man, which is forbidden according to Orthodox law. Um, there's extreme sex segregation in the community. And when I say extreme, I mean extreme in the sense that the only women I spoke to from the age of 13 until 20 was my mother, my grandmother, and my three sisters. I had over 20 aunts. I didn't speak with them. I had hundreds of cousins, female cousins, didn't speak with them. We didn't speak with our female neighbors, um, and so on. Uh, education is, is uh, they don't go to public schools. They don't use the schools that others use. They have their own institutions where they teach their brand of their strict religion. Um, so I hope you understood by now this isn't, maybe even thinking of this community as a religion is misleading. This isn't a religion. I mean, it's a religion as well. But this is something that encompasses and controls every second of your being. There isn't a second in your day that you're not thinking about what you can and cannot do. There's a, there's a corpus of law called the Shulchan Aruch, which is the, the, the canonized orthodox law, and that controls every second of your day. You wake up in the morning, you want to put on your shoes, there's a rule of how you do it. You can't just put on your shoes, okay? You've got to slip in your right foot in your right shoe. You don't tie your shoe. You slip in your left, shoe, your left foot in your left shoe, then you tie your left shoe, and then you tie your right shoe, okay? And there's detailed reasons there's generations of scholars arguing about this detail of how to put your shoes on. Um, it, it's, it's funny, but it's also sad because this is the, the Jewish intellectual spirit's response to being closed off in ghettos and not being allowed to go to uni. Um, for, for generations in Europe, they just started doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> on the Saturday, it says in the Bible you should rest from work. You get ridiculous things from that. You can't tear your toilet paper to wipe your bum on, on, on the Saturday because doing so is creating work. You're tearing something. So hunt thousands of Orthodox families before sunset on Friday sit there and tear toilet paper so it's pre, pre teared Okay, so what does the schooling system look like? They, there's an extensive network of ultra-Orthodox schools. Now, one thing not many people know about is that within ultra-Orthodox communities, there's very few people you can talk to as an ultra-Orthodox Jew even within the community. Why? Because being such an extreme ideology, you think that almost everyone else has got it wrong. Okay? <laughs> so I belong, I belong to a specific sect within the community called Satma. <coughs> Satma won't talk to the sect called Bells. Bells won't talk to the sect called, to the sect called Chabad and so on. There are hundreds of them. There's no intermarriage, um, and they have separate schools. So you have a situation where in Stanford Hill, you have hundreds of different institutions for kids at different schools because they won't share schools. Now, not only won't Satma talk with Bells, the Satma Rebbe, the, the lead of Satma, died in 2006, and he had two kids. Each kid started his own. <laughs> And now Satma A won't talk to Satma B, and Satma B won't talk to Satma A. And they won't intermarry, so they have separate schools. The schooling system in Haredi communities is separated roughly, so there's, there's primary school until the age of 13, when you bar mitzvah, according to Jewish law, you're an adult. And from the age of 13, you go to what's called yeshiva. From the age of 13, almost no Hasidic yeshiva will teach any secular education whatsoever because they believe you're an adult now, you've got to devote all your life to the study of God's law. So they have yeshiva, it's like secondary school, except, except that you don't learn anything. Of course you do, you learn Talmud, but no secular education, no maths, no English, no history, no science. Um, so and ac according to law, you can't do that. You can't have a secondary school where you don't teach any edu uh, secular education. So all yeshivas in Stamford Hill are illegal schools, all of them. And there are roughly 30 yeshivas that I can name. All of them illegal. The government is aware of them. I'll come to talk a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, for primary schools, most Hasidic schools believe that kids under the age of 13, they're allowed, they shouldn't learn a lot of secular education, uh, but they're allowed to have an hour or so a day. That's fine. Um, and so most schools are legal. 
there's issues with these schools. They're always inadequate upon Ofsted uh, inspection, um, but most of them are legal. My family um, was holier than that, so even the primary school I went to was illegal. And this is the, very, is the one primary school in my community that was illegal because they believe that from birth you mustn't study any secular education. So I spent my years in Cheda from the age of three. Cheda is the, is the Yiddish word for primary school. From the age of three until the age of 13, um, we studied very important things like what happens, the Tal Talmud has discussions, what happens if your neighbor's ox kills your cow, who has to pay, um, and what kinds of linens and cloths you cannot mix together and wear. Um, very important life skills. And, and no, as in no English, no maths, no nothing. None of the teachers were qualified. They don't believe in that kind of qualifications. These goyim, these non-Jews are not going to come and tell us uh, what and how we should raise our kids. Um, and they use the biblical line of uh, um, withhold your rod, hate your son to, uh, to, for, for, for discipline. So if we were misbehaving, we were cheeky, we, did, we came late, uh, we were hit. Um, and there was a whole method of, of how the teachers would hit us. Uh, they usually, teachers usually had a, 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 a set of sticks um, depending on the severity, so a small stick if it's a small offense, big stick if it's a big offense. And they were very creative, these teachers. Twigs, branches, rulers, uh, all kinds of things, and they didn't shy away from using their hands as well. Um, it was also a very unsafe environment, that illegal school I went to. Um, they didn't have a fridge, so for breakfast they stored the milk in the winter, they stored it on the roof of the, of the school, and every day there was a rotor of one child would have to climb up on the roof and get the milk down. And this is not with a ladder, climbing up on pipes, getting the milk down. Um, I don't think this would pass any risk assessment uh, in, 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 a, in a secular school. The, the, the hygiene conditions were horrific. And excuse my, my, my French here, but there were rivers of urine flowing out of the toilet. It was not cleaned, nobody looked after it, nobody cared. All that matters was the spiritual growth in their interpretation. Um, every year there was a period when we would hide because there was a legal school nearby, um, neighboring us, and, and when we knew inspectors were coming to that school, we didn't want to give the impression that we're there, we would hide. So we were very aware that we're illegal, the kids knew, we were aware. Um, but we had this narrative that these are the evil, the evil uh, people who do dislike our faith trying to convert us to their agenda. So the kids supported the teachers in hiding. Nobody thought, wait a minute, let me, ex let me complain to them about the hitting. Uh, let me tell them the bad conditions because we were told we were the, right, we were the good guys. Um, so how did I get here? When I was a teen, I started asking questions and I started thinking and reading books I wasn't meant to, um, in, in Yiddish, of course, uh, because I couldn't speak English or read English back then. Um, but there's plenty of material in Hebrew and Yiddish that is of a heretical nature. Um, no, no, I'm serious. Uh, there's, there's plenty of uh, Yiddish sectorists that have written stuff in Yiddish, and, and, and Hebrew atheists, so, uh, Israeli atheists have written stuff in Hebrew, so there is. Um, uh, eventually, I started, I realized I wanted to, to know more about my country, I wanted to, uh, to, to, uh, to meet people outside of my community, so I started teaching myself English. Um, so I got hold of this dictionary, um, which was made available for the girls in the community. So what I didn't say is that girls in the community are brought up very differently to boys. So boys have the commandment that they have to study the Torah all day long. Girls are allowed to study other things, so girls usually do have a better secular education. Um, Ironically, the sex, so, so the reason girls don't study the Torah is because they're not holy enough, right? Um, and they, they're not clever enough to understand uh, the Torah. I, I don't believe that anymore, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, but ironically, the sexism that says that women are inferior to men results in the fact that women are far more educated than men because they can study English. Um, so, it was, so I got hold of this dictionary that the community publishers for the girls in the community. Now, you can't just use any old dictionary because you have words like sex in there. And, you know, we can't have our pure girls reading such words. So they published their own censored version of dictionary, which has all the bad words uh, taken out. I looked up, it doesn't have the word Christmas in it, for example, in this censored dictionary. Um, uh, Jesus was a bad Jew. Um, 
Uh, so I got hold of this dictionary. I started teaching myself, reading, uh, reading children books in English. Um, eventually, I started uh, sneak into, uh, sneaking into libraries, and I could read English books. Um, I brought home books, hid them under my mattress, and I practiced reading uh, like that. Um, at the age of 20, uh, I got hold of the internet, which, oh, I, I, f I forgot to mention. Uh, all forms of social media um, uh, are forbidden. All access to uh, the outside world in that way are forbidden. So uh, Hasidic Jews don't watch TV, they don't listen to the radio, they don't read newspapers. Um, they have newspapers of their own in Yiddish, but they don't read uh, English newspapers. Um, and of course, the internet is strictly banned. So once I got hold of the internet, it was, it was a whole new world opened up. Suddenly I could see I'm not the only crazy person with doubts. There's a whole community out there of people who who think that this stuff is crazy and, and who questions things. So it was really liberating. And it didn't take me much, it didn't take me long. After three months of being on the internet, I, I no longer believed a thing. Um, so, so maybe the rabbis are right that the internet is dangerous. Um, <laughs> um, now, leaving. I was about to leave the community. I no longer believed. I wanted to go to university. I wanted to study philosophy and physics, which I am doing now. Um, but I didn't have any education. Um, at that point, I could speak English already, but I hadn't met any non-Jewish person. Not only non-Jewish, non-Orthodox person. I hadn't met any non-Orthodox Jews. So uh, I got hold, I got in touch with this charity called Mavar, which I'm greatly indebted to. Um, so this is a charity set up specifically to help people in my situation and, and help them explore the world. Um, they advised me on how to go about uh, get, catching up on education. My goal was as soon as possible to be, to be in university because I was a 20 year old without a high school level education and I felt very self-conscious and I wanted to be at the point where, where you know, I've done that, I'm at university, okay, yes, I'm a couple of years older than others, but it's not a big deal. Um, so in my first year after leaving, I took the three basic GCSEs you need to get into university. So I took a, a science GCSE, maths and English. And the next year I did the foundation course on physics and maths and that was enough and, I, and, the, and a year later I got into Bristol. Now, as soon as I left the community, uh, everyone there cut me off completely. The rabbis told my parents that none of my family is allowed to talk with me. Uh, I'm the oldest of 10, and as you can see, I'm a very dangerous individual. So the rabbis decided I'll be a danger to my siblings' faith. Um, so thankfully now I can laugh about it. It's been four years, but it's, it's, it's been four years since I've spoken with, uh, with almost all of my siblings. Um, eight, eight of my nine siblings. One sibling um, has since been in touch. Uh, three or four months ago, he started communicating me, which I'm, which I'm extremely happy about. Um, but otherwise, my grandparents don't speak with me, my cousins, my friends. In fact, after I left, I phoned my granddad, and uh, he picks up the phone. He's like, hello? I'm like, hey, this is your grandson, Yitzchok. Yitzchok is my Hebrew name. He's like, have you repented yet? I'm like, no, no but I want to talk with you. You know, you're my granddad. And he says, when you repent, call me back. And, and, he, and he knocked down the phone. Um, so I came to uh, university, and this is where the free speech uh, issue will come, in, come about. Now, I had this very idealistic uh, and perhaps <coughs> mythological view of the universe that outside, yes, in the community I was repressed and I didn't have free speech and I couldn't question, but surely outside in the world, everyone cherishes their freedom and everyone is just liberal and enlightened and secular and everyone just goes around free, talking their mind and everyone's like respectful. It's like, sure, I disagree, but you know what? Yeah, good for you for holding that opinion. And, <laughs> and perhaps I was naive, uh, or, um, but I came to uni and I was quite disappointed that just saying very basic things can get you in trouble. Um, like, you know, uh, probably the speech I made here I was, was be, would be considered anti-Semitic, despite the fact I'm still a proud Jew. Um, and, and as we've heard before from other speakers, they say that they've been called Islamophobic again, despite the fact that they're proud Muslims. Um, so I was very disappointed about that. Um, so I decided to change it. Uh, on campus, I started last year uh, the Bristol Free Speech Society, um, which besides for being Nazi and fascist and everything else, what we also do... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm very, I, I need to be more careful here because I don't even know if people may be so far removed from the university context that they don't get the joke. They, they, they think about it for a second. I have been called on multiple occasions a fascist on campus, okay, and I'm left off center, but I'm a fascist. Um, read the news. Uh, 
So I started the Free Speech Society. We invite speakers to have, uh, to have discussions about a, a, ride, a wide range of ideas. Um, and we especially want to have these difficult discussions where, where people get heated up and people start, instead of arguing, they start resorting to ad hominems and to yo mama. And so, you know, that kind of uh, uh, thing. Um, because we, we do believe, and I do believe, and, we as, um, and my society in Bristol believes that we can have respectful dialogue on difficult issues. It doesn't have to be abusive. Um, uh, so we invite speakers to talk about um, transgender issues, with a big, with, which is a big issue on campus, um, Islam, um, and it's, it's, it's an uphill battle. It's a, it's a real struggle. Last month, we invited Emma Fox from the Henry Jackson Society to talk about a report she had written on extremism on campus. And unsurprisingly, she found that there were many, many instances in the year 2017, 2018, of people whom the government describes as extremists being invited on campus to spell their extremism. And we invited her to, to talk about this report. But guess what? These extremists weren't, stop, weren't stopped from coming on campus, but Emma Fox was, okay? So Emma Fox was suddenly overnight branded. Nobody had heard of her before. Uh, she's a young woman, worked with the Henry Jackson Society. And overnight, suddenly, people branded her as an Islamophobe uh, because she was talking about Islamic extremism on campus. And within days, there was a Facebook event with 400 people saying they're going to protest and make sure the event doesn't happen. And the university told us they can't protect us. So they shut down the event. Um, and, we, and we have uh, similar things when we talk about transgender issues. It gets very, very heated, very volatile, very quick. Um, I believe some of the audience have been, uh, some of the audiences here have, have been to our event in Bristol um, uh, um, with, where we invited a woman called Heather Brunstall Evans. She's an academic, I believe, in UCL, um, who uh, isn't transphobic, um, isn't a fascist. She just, she just raises issues with uh, the transgendering of kids. She believes that maybe uh, the age, there should be an age restriction or whatever. And we invited her, and the event was, was, was disrupted with protesters coming in and reading names of trans people who were sadly murdered for being trans, as if implying that having a discussion about it means that we suddenly don't care about trans people being murdered. Of course we care. This is having a discussion. What can the government do? The government doesn't, the government wants to help communities like this, but it's very, very difficult. So as we've seen in Birmingham with RSC education, uh, communities are very resistant to outside pressure. Now, when it comes to my particular community, and this doesn't apply to all, uh, to all uh, religious communities, I'm talking about my particular community, I don't think that immediately focusing on RSC education is the way forward. This community is so, so far away from it. It's like trying to introduce liberal democracy in a, a Stone Age society. You know, first they have to develop agriculture, you know, they're not there yet. Uh, I think, I think the, the government should focus on making sure that teachers are qualified, making sure that schools are legal as a bare minimum. If a school is illegal, we don't know what's happening to these kids. If a school is legal, at least we know. There can be inspections, we can know. Um, and making sure that there's basic English education. I don't think it's acceptable that kids are growing up in this country and they can't communicate in the language of their country. And, and hopefully then we can, we can hope that slowly things will change uh, in terms of sex education as well and acceptance of, of the other, acceptance of LGBT individuals, acceptance of atheists. But I, I, I think we, 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 we're very, very far away from that. Um, so that's all I would say in terms of, because there seems to be a conflation of, of people always wanna, people wanna apply the law correctly and they wanna be harsh. They wanna say, what do you mean if a school doesn't teach RSE education? They have to by law. And, um, but we, we've also gotta be pragmatic. We've gotta work with communities. If a community is not there yet, we've gotta work with them to see how we can get them there. Um, rather than uh, being seen by the community as being the enemy from outside coming in and imposing uh, their values on others, and I think at this point I'll, I'll yeah I'll stop.